All right, thank you, Arthur. Thanks, everyone, for being here once again. My name is Chi Sung Park, and I'm excited to share with you a couple of uh, recent projects that my colleagues and I have been working on at the intersection of climate change, human capital, and economic opportunity. But let me start with a couple of stylized facts, beginning with the fact that we've baked a lot of warming into the system. In addition to its magnitude and, and its rapidity, I want to emphasize here the fact that the mapping from a given mean shift in global average temperature, one and a half degrees, two degrees Celsius, et cetera, to local extreme heat events can vary enormously. For instance, in the United States, there are some parts, some cities, where we can expect upwards of 50 additional days per year with temperatures above 90 degrees Fahrenheit by mid-century alone. But as you move closer to the equator in places like Puerto Vallarta, Mexico, or Bangkok, Thailand, that number may be closer to 150 additional days. But even if we stick with the US for a minute, how such heat is felt locally may vary enormously depending on things like one's physical infrastructure and, as I'm about to suggest, one's industry and occupation. OK, fact number two is that this warming comes amid rising inequality, particularly between what you might call the educational haves and have-nots of a society. This phenomenon is particularly pronounced in the United States, but it's also been documented in other countries, whether that's in Europe or in East Asia. And so I've been thinking a lot, uh, spending a lot of time thinking about what facts one and two might mean for economic policy, particularly as it pertains to the labor market. And so in one recent paper, my colleagues and I, we teamed up with the California state government, uh, and we wanted to ask, is there a relationship, a meaningful relationship between temperature and workplace safety? And here, we're able to exploit a unique data set that comprises the universe of workers' compensation insurance claims in the state over a 20-year period. And as with many studies in the recent climate econometrics literature, what we're able to do is, is uh, exploit high-frequency weather variation to, in effect, line the data up in such a way that makes it as if nature herself is running a series of natural experiments. And that allows us to get at causality a little bit more cleanly. One of the findings is that heat appears to increase workplace safety risk considerably. A 90 degree plus day increases workplace injuries by anywhere between 8 and 15%. Perhaps surprisingly, we find that the vast majority of these are actually not heat illnesses or other heat related claims. They're things like falling off of a ladder, getting your hand caught in a conveyor belt, being hit by a moving vehicle. Another perhaps concerning element is that from an equity standpoint, these risks appear to be concentrated highly at the bottom end of the income and skills distribution. Uh, these findings are broadly consistent with earlier work that my colleagues and I have done on the effects of heat on learning and human capital, where we use similarly big administrative data sets to explore, among other things, how hotter temperature affects exam performance. So if you took your SAT in a non-air conditioned room on a hot day, you probably did worse than you, you otherwise would have. But maybe more importantly, from a climate change standpoint, cumulative heat exposure over time appears to reduce the rate of learning and human capital formation for some students more than others. So much so that in the US, we estimate that up to 7% of racial educational achievement gaps may actually be attributable to differences in thermal learning environments that are inclusive of both geography and building conditions like school air conditioning. OK, so a lot of open questions. I just want to flag two that I'm currently really excited about and working on. Uh, which have to do with, you know, what do these and other recent findings suggest about economic policy? Not only about optimal climate mitigation, right, how aggressively we should reduce emissions, but also about the transition period between now and a more stable climate, whether that's in 2050 or 2100. And just two aspects of this. One, how should we think about adaptation, particularly in the workplace, right? And in particular, I'm interested, when do private markets get adaptation right, and when might they fall short? Right? Similarly, I'm interested in, in thinking about what are the possible labor market implications of the clean energy transition that we're already engaging in, right? And here, uh, I'm curious to know whether we can actually use data to inform who will be the winners from this transition in a labor market sense, and who will be the losers, and what is the role, if any, of government in smoothing that transition? So uh, among many things that I'm excited to, to potentially work with you on, and uh, with that, I'll pass it over to the next speaker.